2013, you can manage complex calendars that interact with the schedules of multiple people in real time. Or you can keep to the basics. You create whatever calendar makes sense for you. In this course, we'll focus on using the calendar for business, but you can take what you learn here and apply it to any other use, such as scheduling personal time. Start by adding a new item, a new appointment, or a new meeting. The only difference is that a meeting includes other people. Since we're just starting out, let's keep it simple and add a new appointment. Click where you want to add the appointment, and then click the item. Type a subject and a location. An appointment can be anything you want it to be. In this case, we're just blocking out time to get some work done in the office. You can use the calendar like this to help you keep organized. This area shows the time you selected on the calendar, but you can change it if you want. Down here you can add more details. Since you're the only one who will use the appointment, you can add whatever you want. Click Insert and Attach File. Then let's attach the PowerPoint file we'll be working on. There, the appointment is done. But let's add a few more options. In Show As, you can choose how you want others to view your time. This is useful if you share your calendar. We'll get into sharing later. For now, let's keep the default selection busy so that anyone who sees the entry will know you don't want to be interrupted at this time. Next, you can set a reminder. If you don't do anything, you'll get a reminder message 15 minutes before the start time. Let's change that to one hour. Finally, let's color code the appointment by adding a category. You don't have to do this, but it can be helpful if you have a very crowded schedule. I've added a few of my own categories. There, now we can quickly spot the times we set aside to work alone. When you're done, click Save and Close. There's the appointment. If you want to change the duration, select the appointment and drag the bottom border. Or you can drag the whole thing to move it to a different time and date. At one hour before the appointment start time, we get a reminder message. You can dismiss the reminder or click Snooze to be reminded again five minutes before the start. In the calendar, you can read the subject and maybe the location and some details, depending on how large an appointment is. But if you want to see more details, just hold the mouse over an item to get a peek. If you want to view or change options, right-click the item, or click it and use the Calendar Tools Appointment tab on the ribbon. If you want to edit the item, double-click it, make your changes, and then click Save and Close. One more thing you might want to do is print an appointment. Click the File tab on the item, then click Print. If you want to see how your appointment will look in print, view the Print Preview over here, and click Print. So now you have the basics for creating and viewing appointments. Up next we'll get into more detail on how to change calendar views. To help you get a handle on your schedule, you need to be able to change how you view the calendar. Start with the Arrange buttons on the Home tab. View a single day, the week, the work week, which excludes Saturday and Sunday, or a whole month. Schedule view displays the calendar on a horizontal timeline. Click the dialog box launcher to change view settings such as your work hours. Now go to the View tab, and you can change your layout. For example, you can add the reading pane. This is nice if you want to view the calendar and individual items side by side. Take some time to explore the other options on the View tab, like Time Scale. With this, you can change how much time detail you view. For example, you can view time in 15-minute increments. As your calendar grows, you can use the Tools and Options in Outlook to help you move around and find things. These arrows at the top of the calendar move you forward or back. Depending on which view you select, you'll move one day, one week, 
or a month. You can move faster by clicking a date in these calendars. Another way to select a date is to click the Go To dialog box launcher on the Home tab. But often the fastest way to find an appointment or meeting is to use Search. Type your text here and press Enter. The items containing the text appear in a list. Double click an item to open it. To return to your calendar, click the X in the search box. Up next, we'll go back to the appointment we created in the first movie and turn it into a meeting. Let's say we decide to get help with the presentation we're working on. All we have to do is invite people to the appointment we created in the first movie, and then we can turn it into a meeting. Just click Invite Attendees, and the appointment becomes an email form with a two line and a send button. Also, this tab changes to Meeting. We could have clicked this button to create a new meeting, but this is less work because the form is mostly filled out. Click 2 to open the address book. Click a name, and then click Required. Add as many names as you want. If a person is not required, click Optional. Click OK when you're done. Next, let's change the category from Work Alone to Team. We also might want to change locations. Click Rooms. If your organization shows conference rooms and other resources in the address book, you can add a room here. Click Yes. The location is updated, and the room name is added to the two line. The last thing we'll do is add a message down here to give our recipients more information about the meeting. Then click Send. Each person on the two line, including the person who schedules the conference room, receives an invitation that looks like this. Regardless of whether they're using the Outlook program or working with their email in a browser using the Outlook web app, they can note the location and time and read your message. Then they can choose to accept, tentatively accept, or decline the invitation. They can also edit their response before sending it. An email form opens where they can enter a message. Then they click Send. You can review the email from the people you invite. You can also open the meeting request in your calendar to see how many people have accepted, tentatively accepted, or declined. Up next, we'll use the scheduling assistant to help us expand the meeting. After you get the basic parts of the schedule blocked out, you can add more detail as you go along, and send updates to keep everyone in the loop. In this event, I added a contact name and some other details. Let's send the update, and click Yes to close the message. Next, to make sure everyone gets the new information, select Send Updates to All Attendees. As we add more information, we can switch from Month View to a view that shows more detail. Click Week. To view the personal calendar, check it in the folder list. With both selected, you get a side-by-side -side view. There are a couple of other ways to view multiple calendars. Go to the View tab and click Overlay. This superimposes the calendar so you can quickly see where you have conflicts. You may also want to click Schedule View, which moves the week to a horizontal timeline. Click Working Hours until it's not highlighted to view events that occur outside normal working hours. Let's click Week to go back to Week View and add another layer of detail to the calendar. On the View tab, click Daily Task List and Normal. And this section at the bottom of the calendar opens where we can insert daily tasks. As with appointments and meetings, a task doesn't have to be a task. It can be any kind of reminder or to-do item connected to a time. Click below a day and start typing. Tasks are very similar to appointments. In fact, if you find that a task is easier to visualize as a block of time, you can quickly convert it. For example, we can take this reminder to drive to Santa Fe and drag it to the calendar. 
and adjust the handle at the bottom of the appointment to cover the time it will take for the drive. To see all the things you can do with the task, double-click it. As you can see, instead of start and end times, tasks have start and due dates. Since we're just using a task as a reminder, the two dates are the same. But you could create a task for writing a novel, for example, with a due date two years in the future. Then as you worked on the task, you could update the status, priority, and percent complete options, and add details, even attachments. Here's something we can use for our tour planning. When you add a new task or to-do item, you become the owner of it by default. But you can assign that task to another person by clicking Assign Task. Just enter a name on the two line. Even though you're delegating the item to an associate, you can keep an updated copy in your task list and receive a status report when it's completed. Add a message if you want, and click Send to send the task. The recipient of the task opens the email. If they accept the task, it's added to their task list. They can click to send the response right away, or edit the response first, and click OK. When you finish a task, you can mark the task as complete by clicking the flag icon. The task is cleared from the daily task list in the calendar, but you can view it in all your tasks by clicking Tasks in the navigation bar and To-Do List in the folder list. Completed tasks have a line through them. Here are a couple of more things you might find useful. Creating your own to-do list and categorizing personal tasks. Right-click to-do lists and click New Folder. You could create a tour folder to keep your tour-related tasks separate from your personal tasks. We don't need to do this because we'll be using the daily task list in the calendar. However, I'll use Categories. Select a task, then click Categorize and choose a color. Now I can quickly locate my personal tasks. We've used the calendar and task tools to help us set up a promotional tour. But the tour will only be a success if everyone on the tour team is on the same page. Up next, we'll share the calendar. In this calendar, we use meeting requests to share information for each event. But you can also share the whole calendar by sending it an email, by publishing it on a website, or by sharing it through your email provider. To email a calendar, click Home and Email Calendar. Specify the calendar to email and choose how much detail you want the recipients to see. And click OK. And the calendar is added to an email. Add your recipients and click Send. Similarly, you can click Publish Online and publish this calendar to host a snapshot of the calendar on a website. This and other sharing options are covered in more detail in the Calendar Basics course. There's a link to it in the course summary at the end of this course. The ultimate option, though, is sharing through an email provider that uses Microsoft Exchange. Because we created the tour calendar online using Exchange, we can give the people we share the calendar with permission to edit the calendar and view updates instantly. If we didn't have an Exchange account, we could have saved it to a data file on our computer. But then we'd only be able to email or publish the calendar. If you don't know what type of email account you have, click File and then Info. Under Account Information, click the drop down list at the top. If your account is anything other than Microsoft Exchange, check with your email provider to see if they have a solution for sharing calendars using a browser app. Let's set up the tour calendar for sharing. Select the calendar, click Home, click Share Calendar, and a sharing invitation opens. Add the people you want to share the calendar with on the two line. Next, check this option so recipients can add, edit, and delete items. Then we'll click Send and Yes. Now click Calendar Permissions. Here you can select people you're sharing the calendar with and change their permissions at any time. Or you can add or remove a person. Let's select Leslie Harper and increase her permissions to Owner.
Here's how it works when team members receive the sharing invitation. They click the email, and then open this calendar. And the tour calendar is added to their calendar list. They can then set up their calendars and tasks any way they want. Note that their daily task list includes their personal tasks, as well as the tasks that we assign to them. Team members have permission to open and edit any calendar item. They can then send an update. But all they really have to do is save the item, and anyone viewing the shared calendar will see the changes immediately. Because the shared calendar is now the primary source of information, team members can remove the old meeting items from their personal calendars. The duplicate items are easy to see in Overlay View. Finally, if you switch back and forth a lot between calendars, here's a way to save some steps. Set up the calendars the way you want them, then click Calendar Groups, and Save as New Calendar Group. Type a name for the group, and click OK. Now the calendar groups you use most often are easy to get to. A lot of work will go into this calendar as the tour progresses. When it's all over, you can archive it for future reference. Up next, we'll do just that. After the tour, we can remove the calendar from Outlook so we have more room for other things. But before we do, let's make a backup copy of the schedule to keep for future reference. Select the calendar. Then click File, Open an Export, and Import Export. Click Export to a File, and Next. Click Outlook Data File, and Next. Make sure the calendar is selected, and click Next. Then browse for a location to save the file, type a name for it, and click OK. Then click Finish. Type and verify a password if you want to restrict access to the calendar. We'll just leave this blank and click OK. Now with the calendar backed up, we can right-click the calendar in the folder list and click Delete. And click Yes to send it to the Deleted Items folder. If you have second thoughts, you can retrieve the calendar before you empty your deleted items. Click the ellipsis in the navigation bar and Folders. Locate the calendar under Deleted Items, and move it back to your active calendar. We won't do that, though, but sometime in the future, we may want to open the calendar we backed up. To do that, click File, Open and Export, and Import Export. This time, click Import from another program or file, and Next. Click Outlook Data File, and Next. Browse to the PST file, and select, and open it. Click Next. Open the data file, and click the calendar. We'll import the calendar into the same location we exported it from. And click Finish. Then go to Calendar, and open it. So now you have an expanded awareness of what the Outlook calendar is capable of.